Okay, so uh, this morning I thought that uh, I would start by setting the stage for what's going to be happen, uh, what's going to be happening over the next uh, more than a week here, and really, uh, essentially, uh, maybe giving you the study guide of what I think is really important, the high-level messages that you can try to extract from your instructors uh, as you spend uh, the next uh, uh, few days here. So I wanted to give you a very quick glimpse, though, as we start uh, about the argon. Uh, you might think uh, we're so close that we're really talking that, that Fermi is right over here. We're actually closer to Fermi National Lab than we are to argon at this particular point here at uh, Pheasant Run. But argon and Fermi are both right here, as you, as you know. But the DOE is actually a very large organization, and uh, uh, some people don't uh, know quite much about it. So I thought I'd just say a, a minute or two that the DOE does open science research and research in support of the national security interests for the country. And there are three very large uh, open science research laboratories, Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, down here, Argonne, and then Lawrence Berkeley are the three big, what we call multi-purpose, open research laboratories. And what this means, uh, open research laboratory, multi-purpose, is that these three labs uh, investigate and explore science in many areas. Computing is one, biology, uh, uh, nuclear physics. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of different areas of science that the labs are, are interested in. And you'll have several speakers here from other labs uh, as well. And, uh, and these labs also maintain large computing facilities. And Argonne and Oak Ridge are two of the largest of these computing facilities uh, for open science, which means everyone here can apply for an account and get on, and that's uh, uh, one of the exciting things about our system uh, at Argonne. And so that's sort of where we are, and the, many of the people who you hear uh, speaking will be from uh, uh, industrial uh, partners, collaborators, will be from uh, um, uh, colleges and universities and the laboratories themselves. So it's a pretty wide mix. Uh, Argonne uh, goes back. In fact, uh, it is really the first national laboratory in this sense. Uh, it goes right back to uh, the work of Enrico Fermi uh, at uh, University of Chicago. And those of you who know your history, I think NPR did a story on this some time ago. It was quite fun uh, to hear about it. Uh, and uh, the, the work of Enrico Fermi to build one of the first uh, sustained, or the first sustained nuclear reaction, controlled sustained nuclear reaction, uh, in the, uh, under the squash courts at University of Chicago, uh, where they piled up uh, uh, graphite and uh, 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 nuclear material and had a controlled sustained reaction. Now, uh, you can imagine doing that today at a university uh, might be a problem. Uh, and uh, it wasn't very long before folks there decided, well, you know, we need to move way out somewhere where, where uh, we could do these experiments and they'd never have a problem. Uh, so they moved all the way out to uh, what is now Argonne. Of course, now all the suburbs have, have moved in. Uh, but at that time, Argonne was a fantastic, uh, you know, remote place. Uh, and this is what it looks like today. And I hope, uh, let me ask, I'll just ask now, how many of you have been to Argonne before? Uh, maybe like a, not quite half, I would say. Well, some of those are, are uh, instructors. So the instructor, Pavan, you don't count. You, you work at Argonne. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Argonne is surrounded by this beautiful woods, and we hope that sometime you're able to uh, come visit and spend some time with us. It's fairly large, uh, 3,000 uh, plus employees. You can see the APS in the background there. And then the building that is the supercomputer building for Argonne, where we have uh, our large systems uh, and all the computer scientists, is this uh, new building right here. In the back here, right here, is where Blue Gene Q is. And uh, I think a lot of your uh, uh, instructors will be talking about uh, the high-end supercomputing and these machines like Blue Gene Q and the machine at Oak Ridge and others. So uh, this push in the national laboratory system uh, to develop the next generation technology is actually a really big strategy for the nation. One of the things that President Obama was recently at Argonne to talk about was the uh, battery program at Argonne. 
uh, and uh, there's a new center for uh, exploring energy storage. And the reason this is such a big deal uh, is that right now the only thing that prevents us from completely changing all of our cars over to electric cars is, is the battery. There would, be, there would be no reason for us to have you know, internal combustion cars at this point uh, if we had a fantastic battery that could store as far as I go on an electric tank and then, and then be able to recharge it in the same time it takes me to fill up with gas. Electric cars are simpler, uh, the, the mechanics are simpler, the engines are, are, uh, are simple, the motors are, are simple, uh, and we would change over in a minute. It's also cheaper in terms of uh, uh, gas, miles per gallon, uh, sort of miles per, per uh, stored electricity, stored watt. So it's these sort of breakthroughs that we expect supercomputers to help with, and you'll be hearing more about these kinds of programs. But I wanted to point out that the parallel programming school, the, the two weeks, uh, almost two weeks that you're here, is really a time to soak in so that these kind of challenges, to completely reinvent something here uh, in technology, in science, is what we're hoping. Uh, we hope that several years from now we can point to a graduate of the school and say they worked and learned that piece and they were instrumental in developing this next technology that, for example, frees us from, uh, uh, from fossil fuels. Okay, so how long have folks been doing this? Well, there's two people. Uh, there's one person in this picture who uh, uh, is here, and there's another that will be uh, giving a bit of a lecture uh, later this week. Uh, so Argon has been working in parallel computing and teaching uh, architecture and parallel computing for a long time. This is the Math and Computer Science Division uh, back in uh, 1983, and uh, you can if you haven't yet picked your host out, uh, Paul Messina, uh, he's right here, back from uh, 1983. He didn't spend the last 30 years here at Argonne, but uh, uh, he helped uh, found the first uh, Math and Computer Science Division. And very soon after the Math and Computer Science Division at Argonne started, people realized it's all about parallelism. And that was actually, I mean, you might think now, that's, that's uh, uh, obvious, but back then, switching over to a new model uh, was a big deal. And so uh, this quote here, you know, Los Alamos has a Donnell core HEP, let's experiment with it. Uh, this idea that we're going to move into exploring all sorts of new architectures and understand how to build large parallel, eventually large parallel programs. A little bit more history and then we're going to talk about the, the tech. Early on they started an advanced facility to explore all these uh, architectures. They really wanted to encourage experimentation, uh, look at novel designs. And in fact, you're gonna see lots of novel, in fact, some uh, last night there was already a intro talk on the, some of the architectural issues. And you're gonna see that throughout the week, the architectural uh, changes that are happening. And these are not small. In fact, Peter Kogi is gonna be talking about some of the issues, how technology has changed. And there was a period for uh, almost a decade where things were very stable in, a, in an area of computing. And right now we're in a big change again. And so uh, looking back on what happened in 1984, we can see that this is about to happen again, that you, this class here, is on an edge where everything in software and hardware is changing and you have to adapt to it. And that's what will make this class uh, both difficult and very challenging, and I'm going to give you some examples here. Uh, back then, this is in the early, uh, uh, or in the mid-90s or so, Ken Kennedy had a large, uh, from Rice, had a very large group of folks looking at parallel programming. And if you look here on the right, uh, this, is, this was the, uh, the zoo of different parallel architectures and different uh, parallel machines. And uh, uh, a lot of these companies went out of business. Of course, Intel didn't. But uh, Kendall Square Research, MassPAR, SGI went through several procurements. Sequent is uh, bought up and gone. So there was a big churn. And we're seeing that today as well in the space with uh, um, uh, new upstarts coming in. Uh, ARM is a, you know, a new player. Uh, how we're doing GPGPU programming. So we'll likely see another one of these changes where we're looking at lots of architectures. And so uh, your approach to parallel programming is going to be very important. 
as we dive into that, let me point out that this idea of training and doing these multi-day or several week courses goes all the way back to really in the uh, uh, late 80s. And so this course, although new, uh, has been done several times, this style, uh, where uh, you have access to architects and people designing the next systems. When I was a, uh, a PhD student, uh, I was part of a DARPA NASA fellowship and the same sort of thing. We were able to get together with folks. I got to meet Seymour Cray and other uh, people in the industry. And you are in the same situation. So I would very much recommend that during the week, at dinner time, at lunch time, that you find the people who are speakers, sit down with them, and uh, you know, several years from now you'll say, you know, I got to have lunch with uh, this particular uh, speaker who was here this week with Peter Kogi or Pavan. I got to have lunch with Pavan. Uh, now, 10 years ag from now, that'll mean something. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, you'll go, I had lunch with him. So I really recommend that you sit down and spend as much time, not just amongst yourselves, but at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, getting to know the, the speakers and, uh, and asking them questions. All right, so of course we have our large machine at, uh, at Argonne. Oak Ridge, Berkeley, others will be making, have made their machines available. But now I want to start talking about uh, what you should do in this course, uh, what you should do for the next week. So when I worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory, John Reinders posited this in about 1996. He called it the parallel platform paradox. And I know the print is a little small, I'll read it here. It says, the average time, now first I have to back up, he was a uh, applied mathematician plasma physicist, so uh, he sees the world through the eyes of a physicist. So the average time required to implement a moderate sized application on a parallel computer architecture is equivalent to the half-life of the latest parallel supercomputer. So what he was trying to say and uh, became the mantra of the code developers and people who really push in the envelope on making large parallel applications is that it takes a long time to build up and develop a large parallel application. So long, in fact, that by the time you're done, many of the computers that you started on will be gone. And this was very frustrating to this group of physicists. And I want to read this part from a book here uh, that they wrote about this topic uh, as, they, as they really pushed new methods and new techniques uh, for parallelism and uh, parallel programming. It says, although a strict definition of half-life could be argued, no computational physicist in the fusion community would dispute the fact that most of the time spent implementing parallel simulations was focused on code maintenance rather than exploring new physics. Architecture, software environments, and parallel languages came and went, leaving the investment in new physics code buried with the demise of the latest supercomputer. There had to be a way to preserve that investment. So the problem that everyone is facing, and the, maybe the, the thesis of uh, my talk this morning with respect to parallel programming for supercomputers, is that this has to be an important part of your design. That you're really designing for a piece of code, you're going to work on a piece of code, and in your design, you have to imagine it lasting 5, 10 years, 15 years. And we have codes at Argonne that have evolved. Completely new physics cores, completely new pieces, solvers, but they have lasted 15, 20 years. And taking that approach that what you're working on is a project that is a 10-year project affects how you start that work and ultimately, though, will allow you to do the physics, to do the cool science on the inside and not spend all your time doing the code maintenance. So I'm going to give you some investment tips. Uh, you know, there was, had to be a way to preserve that investment. So these are my investment tips for the next uh, 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 few days here. The areas that when all the speakers are presenting their material, things to really focus on uh, in your notes, things to, to think about with respect to your 10-year code the thing you're imagining uh, that you uh, uh, evolve. So the very first one, I'm just going to start out. Everyone should already know this, but I'm going to repeat it. Other people's libraries. 
uh, you would be surprised at how many people decide to write a dense matrix multiply. Uh, or, uh, you know, I had a student a couple years ago who, who uh, decided to write a wiki as part of the summer project. Well, the wikis are out there, they don't do exactly what I want. So he, uh, he spent several weeks and went off and wrote his own wiki. Uh, of course, he was the only user of that. Uh, and uh, then, you know, when things got upgraded, it, it fell away. Uh, so spending your time, there will be many speakers who are talking about uh, the fast math, other libraries. Uh, Jack Nagara will be here. Spend your time. It's it, totally a wise investment to understand the libraries, not just math libraries, but other libraries, and pull them into your code as soon as possible and as often uh, as possible. Uh, always seek to find someone's great piece of code that they're maintaining and they're updating rather than writing your own from scratch. Unless that writing your own from scratch is part of your exploration, you're trying to understand something. Encapsulation, I'm gonna have one or two slides about that. Uh, there are three things that in your parallel programming you should seek to encapsulate. And I'll, uh, um, as I said, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But parallelism, messaging, and I.O. I, you might also uh, say some of the library issues. But these three things should, in the flow of your program, when you're explaining this to people, should be something that could be encapsulated, hidden, uh, other routines, handling it, and coming back. I'll show you an example. Other, there are four things that you should be looking at this week to embed in your parallel programs. Debugging, performance monitoring, correctness detection, and resilience. I'm going to spend a moment just with each. So debugging. Debugging is not an activity that you fire up uh, some program, some piece, after you've written the code and then say, okay, now I need to debug it. But actually, there's an active way to make debugging possible while you're writing the code. So I encourage you this week, as you hear people, they'll be talking about tools, there will be a lot of discussion about uh, code, and there'll be, Anshu will be talking about code maintenance and, and uh, uh, build. Spend time understanding how, even today, as you work on your code, how you embed debugging capabilities into the code. The same for performance monitoring. You'll have uh, uh, you know, both uh, um, the HPC Toolkit, uh, um, Tau, and others, are things that you can embed from day one in your code, in your approach, and will guide your approach for how to move forward in programming. Correctness detention, detection. Now, this is a kind of a tricky one. Uh, there's a great paper, if you have time to look at it later, uh, uh, Dan Reed and others did a paper in supercomputing several years ago where they introduced random errors in the codes, in a variety of codes, and, and looked at how many codes actually know that an error has happened, that memory has changed, that something has gone wrong. And the number of codes that just at the end spit out, you know, NAN, not a number, and had no clue that anything had gone wrong was quite high. The number of codes that had self-checking, that had correctness detection in the code built in, so the answers coming back from subroutines were checked. Does this really work? Does it, does it match what I would expect? Uh, is there a way to bound the error? Uh, uh, were few, and that's a very important thing as you look at scaling up large codes. Of course, building in resilience is another one of these big things. Right now, we're looking at, and you'll hear more about it, future computers maybe being uh, uh, more likely to fail, uh, individual nodes fail. It's also important that you view your code as you work uh, um, on this from two workflow perspectives. The first is the science workflow. Many people dive right in, open up a C file, open up a C++ or Fortran file, and they think, okay, here's my code. This is my piece right here. This is it. it. Really, it fits into a workflow. And you will profit most if you really spend some time drawing that workflow out from problem setup all the way through to running the code and analysis. Because there are things that you can do in your code now for setup and analysis which will give you better results which will uh, help you and, and you'll be able to write faster. The second workflow view, though, is the programmer workflow. And as I said, Anshu will, uh, has been doing this for years and uh, she's an expert in this, this idea of what happens from the programmer perspective of making a modification, testing it, documenting it, committing it, uh, and that <laughs> virtuous cycle uh, that's needed. So from the beginning, from this day in the, in the course on, look at these two workflows. In your, in your code. 
finally, uh, automation, uh, an A-plus build system with nightly test and so forth. People are very resistant to, to move in this direction initially. Oh, I just It's a small piece of code. I'm just still exploring it. But it really pays dividends to start now in having something that has a really A1, a, a first class build system that can rapidly uh, build and ch you can rapidly change something and give it to someone. Uh, another thing I recommend right off the bat is uh, embedded versioning and metadata. If I look at the results from any of your codes and I just pull them up and, and look at the output data file, I should be able to tell what version of the code that ran what compiler was used, uh, the libraries, static libraries, dynamic libraries that were linked in, all of those things which, you know, think forensics, that when you go back and you're looking at versions of your code, you're looking at outputs that other people wrote, ran your code and you want to look in at that, uh, all of that metadata can be built into your code. And there are techniques you can ask folks about uh, uh, to do that. And finally, there are issues with the community, tutorial, web. These are all uh, important issues not, to, uh, um, uh, not focused on uh, here, but they're very important and you should consider them. So these are the areas that I think over the next uh, uh, several days, think very carefully about your investment in your code in these areas. Now, I said I'd give you a couple examples. I wanted to give you, this is an example from Mike Hero uh, on encapsulation. I love this example. Mike Hero is a, uh, a scientist at Sandia National Laboratory. He works on the Trilinos code. And they want to have as many physicists to computer scientists as possible. That's how he describes it. Uh, which is, I want people who can write physics code, write new physics, just like that investment slide I showed you from John Reinders. I want people to spend more time writing physics code and less time having to work with the small details. right? So in that mindset, here's a, a code that they've written. He just shows a giant uh, uh, slab of the code here, uh, 552 lines. And how many lines of that code are MPI specific? This is his slide here, right? Zero. In other words, the, the encapsulation of data that movement, the movement, data movement in the program here has been encapsulated in libraries, in high-level calls, exchange halo, or uh, uh, a redistribute graph, uh, in very high-level calls, which allows uh, at the physics level, at the programmer level, to spend your time here. So that's a big investment. And as you're working on your codes this week, spending time on the encapsulation of those three things, messaging, I.O., and parallelism is very important. The second piece, uh, uh, that I mentioned uh, um, parallelism is it shown in this example here. So this is a source code. Again, you can't read it here. The important bits are how small the red is. Those are the OpenMP pieces that they had to annotate in in order to get the intranode parallelism that they were looking for. Again, the right sort of encapsulation by where they built the libraries, how they constructed things. Getting this encapsulation right will make it possible for you to explore new chemistry, uh, new biology, new physics. A second thing I wanted to point out uh, real quick uh, is the change in programming model that we have and uh, this uh, former notion where equal work was equal time. So for the last 15 years, most parallel programs take the approach, and I would bet most of the codes here as well that you've been working on, where a certain amount of work needs to be done, and I will divide that work up among all of the cores that I have, and the design of the algorithm is such that I am assuming that equal work takes equal time. In other words, if I divide a 12 by 12 by 12 thing here and run it and I run the same size, 12 by 12 by 12, on that part of the machine, that they'll both complete at exactly the same moment. And so I'll spend very little time doing barriers, doing synchronization, or anything else, because they'll all complete at the same time. Equal work, equal time. As we move forward into the future, this is not going to be true. In fact, it's already not true. And there are 
uh, great graphs where scientists have been running on large machines and because of an ECC memory correction, because of a little bit uh, too warm of a chip, uh, because of some other uh, um, uh, fault uh, or something else, one processor takes, or ten processors or more, take a little bit more time. And so rather than having this equal work, equal time view, we have this distribution, really, of how codes, how work is done on a computer. So one of the things that I think is important for you as you're looking forward at your algorithms is keep in mind this new trend, equal work is not equal time. So with that, I want to wrap up with uh, some future trends, again, for the next few days here. These are the things that are trending up and things that are trending down. So let's walk through them real quick. So I just mentioned asynchronous uh, and latency hiding, uh, things being asynchronous is trending up, block synchronous mode trending down. Okay, if your code right now relies completely on block synchronous mode, might work for the size of problem you're in right now, scaling up will become increasingly difficult. Uh, ways to solve that, you're going to hear from Sanjay Kale, uh, who works on NAMD and Charm++, and uh, Jack Nagara and others about over decomposition and load balancing and dividing your problem up. Uh, this is trending up. These are things, new techniques that people are using in writing parallel programs. Trending down, as I mentioned, static partitioning per core. Uh, this is very difficult to do at extreme scale. Massive parallelism trending up. Uh, what I would call countable parallelism trending down. The idea that, that you can count P equals the number of compute uh, pieces I have, divide among P these things. Really the uh, number of parallel threads you have is, is massive. Uh, reduced RAM per flop. Okay, so this is a thing that you should be looking at right now in your code. As you scale up, how, sm how small can you keep reducing the RAM per flop, per uh, work unit? Because that's the way architectures are moving. Data movement is expensive. This is, unfortunately, this is the trend. Uh, in the past, flops were expensive. This is trending down. We now know that, you probably know already, that flops are very cheap. Uh, fault and resilience, unfortunately, fault is trending up. Uh, these uh, were having more and more errors uh, per bit, uh, per machine uh, in general. Uh, this idea of taking pure checkpoint restart approach to fault tolerance is trending down. You have to look at alternative ways, and uh, some folks will be talking about that. Finally, low bandwidth to storage is, is trending up, unfortunately. We're losing bandwidth to storage, meaning that in-situ analysis is very important. So looking at your problem right now and saying, what analysis can I do while I'm doing my computation is very important. This old school method of, oh, save it all, and then let the viz guys sort it out, uh, is trending down. That's not uh, uh, the way people are writing future codes.